morning friends we are in chapter two mrs oliver my homeroom teacher didn't even ball me up for being late as i slid into my seat i was disappointed maybe she didn't like me anymore i was in first year junior high at ps 81 between st nicholas and eighth avenues one of the worst girls schools in harlem second only to ps 136 uptown a brand new baby was found flushed down the toilet at ps 136 last week nothing like that happened at my school at least not yet but everything else did. Everybody was excited at school today. There was a rumor that Sara Lee and Louise's gang was going to beat up all the teachers who were failing them. That would be just about every teacher in school except Mrs. Roberts. I don't think even Sara Lee, leader of the Ebonettes, would dare tangle with Mrs. Roberts. She taught us art and was the only colored teacher at our school and nobody messed with her. We didn't even have to, we didn't even take magazines into our, her room. She was that tough. The Ebonettes were the sister gang to the Ebony Earls, the roughest street fighters this side of Mount Morris Park. When the Earls were with their rivals, the Harlem Raiders, from uptown, blood flo flowed all up and down the avenue. When they weren't fighting each other, the gangs jumped the Jew boys who attended the synagogue on 116th Street or mugged any white man caught alone in Harlem after the sun went down. It got so bad that the insurance man for Metropolitan had to hire one of the Ebony Earls to ride around with him for protection when he made his collections. Yeah, the Earls were tough all right, and the Ebonettes tried to be just as bad. The bell rang, and we all trooped down the hall to our first course. Maud was in my class, and we walked together. I sure hope Sarah Lee and them don't beat up Mrs. Oliver, she said. Maud had a square dark face and thick hair. If it wasn't for her bow legs, which made her walk pigeon-toed, she wouldn't have been bad-looking at all. I hope they don't, I agreed. I liked Mrs. Oliver, and she was white-haired and looked like somebody's grandmother. Maud and I sat together in Mrs. Haggerty's class. She was our arithmetic teacher and real pitiful. A pale stick of a woman, scared peeless most of the time. Now she mumbled that we would begin our lessons on page 58 and to please take out our arithmetic books. Almost everybody, including me, took out our love stories and true confessions instead. We didn't even try to hide our magazines in Miss Haggerty's class, and she was so terrified she just ignored them. It was a good time for me to catch up on my love stories because Daddy wouldn't even let me bring those magazines inside the house. He said he didn't want to catch me reading such trash. I usually paid attention to Miss Haggerty for the first five minutes, though, until I decided and could solve the problem. Until I understood and could solve the problem. So today, when she asked for a volunteer for the blackboard, I raised my hand and stood up. Sit down, Sara Lee growled at me, and I sat. Miss Haggerty ignored us both. Do we have a volunteer, she asked again. Nobody moved. Well then, Miss Haggerty said, walking to the blackboard and picking up a piece of chalk. I'll work it out for you. Now the main t thing to remember is, talk a little softer, Louisa said. I can't concentrate on my story. The class tittered and Miss Haggerty's voice dropped to a whisper. I sighed and turned my attention to my magazine. This was one problem I wasn't going to get because I sure wasn't going to tangle with Sara Lee and Louisa. Louisa was Puerto Rican, white Puerto Rican, and was real pretty with her hair cut in a bob with bangs just like Claudette Colbert. Her running buddy, Sarah Lee, was a burnt brown color with red hair of all things. She was extra ugly. There was a rumor that Sarah Lee was a bull dagger. I don't know if that was true or not, but she was certainly rough enough to be a man. Both of them were older than the rest of us because they got left back so often, and everybody, including the teachers, were scared of them. They fought with razors, and the Ebony Earls would beat up anybody that messed with their sister gang. Instead of going back to our second class today, we were sent back to our homeroom and dismissed early. Before Sara Lee could round up her gang, the teachers were going to beat up. The teachers they were going to beat up were long gone. I was glad too that we got out early. Now I could sneak home and avoid Suki. She still went to the elementary school on Madison Avenue because she'd been left back twice. Maud insisted on going down 118th Street on her way home, and wouldn't you know, Daddy would catch us. We was always sneaking around there, hoping to see the prostitutes do something exciting. But they never did nothing but sit with their dresses halfway up their navels, calling out at men as they passed by. So we would walk along, seeing whose dress was up the highest, and if you could really see their thing, because they didn't wear no bloomers. And Daddy was always chasing us out of 118th Street, and there he was now, standing in China Doll's stoop, waiting for us. How many times I gotta tell you, girls, stay out of this street, he looked, he asked, looking very mad. And you, Maud, I thought I could trust you. It wasn't my fault, Mr. Coffin. Francie wanted to... He kicked her ankle as Daddy cut her off. Your father told me before he died to make you mind. Both of you got a licking coming if I catch you on this block again, understand? Yes, Daddy. 
Yes, Mr. Coffin. We ran toward Fifth Avenue and turned the corner. What you trying to do, I asked Maud. Get me a whipping. You know your daddy ain't going to whip you, Francie. Well, don't push my luck. I left her at the stoop and went upstairs. That white man was still up there on the roof, but I wasn't going up there by myself. If me and Sookie were still best friends, I'd tell her about him, and she'd know what to do to make us safe money. I ignored it. I ignored him when he whispered to me to come on up. I leaned against our door. The lock gave, and I went inside. After stringing some beans for dinner, I sat on the fire escape watching Suki downstairs jump in rope with Maud and the twins and some other kids from around the corner. The twins looked so much alike we couldn't tell Maybelle from Floribelle, so we just called them both the twins. They were playing chase, skipping over the rope once and following the leader. I chanted with them, chase the white horse over the rocky mountain. I loved to jump rope and hated to be stuck up here on the fire escape instead of downstairs playing with them. My only consolation was that Suki beat up on the, on the others, too, when she wasn't picking on me. That's Suki. I wondered what made her so mean. She was too pretty to be so evil, the color of a ripe peach where the yellow and the red meet, and her red-brown hair hung to her shoulders in two thick braids. I en envied her that pretty long hair. Where I was flat-chested and hollow, Suki was plump and getting plumper. But she didn't like anybody, not even her mother or father. It was true that Papa Dan did wallow in the in King Kong all day long until he fell out from the stuff. But he was a nice, runty little man with bandy legs, always staggering around, grinning like a fool and tipping his cap at every woman who passed by. He even grinned that time he bowed too low to Annette, a whore, and fell down the cellar steps. Everybody laughed but Suki, who got so mad she called him a drunken son of a bitch when he crawled back up the stairs, still smiling. Suki cursed all the time, and I had to strain, strain some to keep up with her. Daddy didn't even want me to say darn. He was always telling me, it's darn today, damn tomorrow, and next week it'll be goddamn. You're going to grow up to be a lady, Francie, and ladies don't curse. I had to curse some, though, to stay friends with Suki. But I didn't play the dozens, that mother stuff, and I was scared to take the Lord's name in vain. Suki's mother was always going up, upside her head because she was so sassy and telling her she was going to be just like her sister China doll. Mrs. Marco was a tall, thin woman, dried up like a prune, but more but more any like Suki. She was always complaining that her drunkard husband and hard-headed children were more of a cross than she could bear. It was true that Suki was hard-headed, and China Doll was a whore right around the corner. They called her China Doll because she used to be so tiny and pretty with her straight black hair and slanty eyes. She was getting pretty plump lately, but the name still stuck. Suki said her mother loved her sister better than her, but I don't know how she could say that when Mrs. Masco wouldn't even speak to China Doll. It was on account of China that Suki beat me up the last time. All I asked her was why her sister hustled so close to home, and Suki hauled off and punched me right in the nose. I got away from her fast, and it was three weeks later before she finally cornered me outside the candy store. You wouldn't think anyone could stay so, so mad for three weeks that they could bloody up your nose, pull out a handful of hair, loosen one tooth, and give you a solid kick in the side. But Suki did. The same day we, we, the same day we made up, I had to speak first, and Suki never would, and she told me just how China did it. We sneaked around the corner and watched her hustling men off and in off the street. That Suki, you never could tell what she would, what would set her off. This time I hadn't said a mumbling word to her. She got mad at me on sight one day last week and asked if I was ready to fight. Naturally, I wasn't ready. That Suki, I wonder what made her so mean. What I ought to do is go on downstairs and get my whooping over so we could be best friends again. I looked over the railing. They were still jumping rope. Chase the white horse over the rocky mountain. It was after 11 o'clock, and we were getting ready for bed. Sterling was in his room behind the kitchen, and Daddy was in, too. But James Jr. hadn't been home all day. I was helping Mother pull the couch I slept on in the front room away from the wall. Mother thought if the couch was in the middle of the floor, the bed bugs wouldn't get me. But she thought wrong. Every Saturday, Mother scalded the bed springs with boiling water and flit, which must have been those bugs' favorite recipe, because every night they marched right down that wall and bit me just the same. When we were all settled down, Mother and Daddy started arguing in their room in their bedroom next to me. She was asking Daddy one more time if he could go up in the Bronx and get some day's work. Why don't you stop nagging me, woman? Daddy said. You know I don't want I don't want you doing housework. It's not what we want anymore, Mother said. It's what we need. The children need shoes and school clothes. We're all in rags. They also need you to be home when they get home from school. 
Ain't I having enough troubles right now? For Christ's sakes. What you want to start that shit all over again for? We ain't starving yet. We ain't far from it. Daddy didn't answer. After a slight pause, Mother said, Adam, what? The relief people are giving out canned beef and butter. Mrs. Taylor got on last week. I don't know when's the last time I've had any butter. And we may never have any again if I've got to let those damn social workers into my house to get it. Bastards act like they're... It's their money they're handing out. We ain't going on relief, Henrietta, and don't ask me again. So what are we going to do? If you could find some work, they ain't got jobs for the old phase. So how in hell you expect me to find anything? There was a pause, and when Daddy spoke again, his voice was gentle. I'm going to play the piano at three rent parties next weekend. I ought to take ten dollars at each one. That will help some. It's going to be all right, baby. So you stop worrying now and trust me, here. Mother didn't answer. I trusted Daddy. I wondered how come she didn't. The f a few minutes later, I heard the dining room door squeak open. Damn that squeak. James Jr. was going to try and sneak home in the middle of the night. Why didn't he oil that noisy door? Daddy heard him, too, jumped out of bed and ran into the dining room, hollering at the top of his voice. Where you been all day, James Jr.? And before Jr. could answer him, Daddy yelled, Don't you hear me talking to you? Answer me before I knock back, knock you back, before I knock you back down those steps. Me and Mother crept into the dining room and, sterling, scowling fiercely, came down the hall from the kitchen. I've been over on Madison Avenue with Sonny and Valley, James Jr. said. He was big for fifteen and good-looking, just like Daddy. You been down in that cellar with that gang? It's a club room, Junior said. It's a den of thieves, Daddy roared. You cut school today, too? Junior didn't answer. He wasn't defiant like Sterling would have been, but he wasn't scared either. Get me my strop, Francie. Don't beat him, Daddy. Get me my strop. Trembling, I went to the bathroom and pulled the discolored razor strop down from its rusty nail and took it to Daddy. If only Junior would promise to stop playing hooky and hanging out with the ebony earls, I knew Daddy wouldn't beat him. But Junior was stubborn, and as Daddy raised the blackened piece of leather over his head, Junior didn't say a word. Daddy swung the strop with all his might, and the thick end lashed into Junior's shoulders. He winced, but didn't cry out. I'm warning you for the last time, Daddy said, breathing hard. You ain't going to disgrace this family. Stay away from that damn gang, you hear? The strop snapped across Junior's chest. Play hooky one more time, and I'm going to kill you. Another blow landed on Junior's back. You want to be like Skeeter Madison, dead in some alley because of some senseless gang fight. Junior dodged the next blow, knocking over a chair. Or maybe you want to join your friend Pee Wee in Sing Sing. You hear me talking to you? Answer him, I begged silently. But Junior didn't open his mouth. He leaped over a chair and Daddy hemmed him up in a corner. The strop rose and fell harder and harder. Junior tucked his head under his hunched shoulders as the blows rained down on his back. Suddenly I was crying and then screaming. I heard Mother's voice rise sharply over my screams. Stop it, James Adam, that's enough. Daddy stopped, looking around confused. Then he dropped the strop and strode into the bedroom, slamming the door. Francie, stop that screaming, Mother said. Anybody would think you were being murdered. She turned to Junior, and her voice softened. You know better than to make your father mad like that, James Junior. One of these days he's going to kill you. All, you. all of you, go on to bed now. I went back to my couch and dried my eyes on the sheet. Daddy had whipped poor Junior with the thick end of the strop. Whether you got whipped with the thick or thin end depended on how bad you had been. I'd never been whipped with the thick end yet. In fact, Daddy never whipped me. Not because I was all that good, but because I was his favorite. Why hadn't Junior just promised to stop messing around with that stupid gang? He wasn't mean enough to be an ebony earl know-how. How could he ever mug anybody good-natured and nice as he was? Why, when he smiled his whole, why, when he smiled, his whole face laughed. He wasn't like old Sterling, who didn't like anybody, and whose narrow old man's face was full of dark, secret shadows. Still, Junior wouldn't get whipped so much if he spent his time reading and studying like Sterling, who was always sticking up, stick, stinking up the house with his nasty chemicals. You would think Junior would feel bad because his baby brother was going to graduate before he did, but he didn't seem to care at all. On the weekends, Daddy gave Sterling a few dimes, and he'd go to the 42nd Street and do... Real good shining shoes on the stand he made from an orange crate. Daddy said he wished Junior was that enterprising, but Junior acted like he didn't hear him. Anyway, he never did make himself a shoe shine box, and I don't think he knew the way to 42nd Street. After the house quieted down, I sneaked past my parents' bedroom and tiptoed to the back. My brother's room behind the kitchen was so small that the cot and dresser took up all the floor space. Junior slept at the top of the bed and Sterling at the bottom. You all right, Junior? 
I sat on the edge of the bed and he scooted over. Yeah, Francie, I'm all right. I'm too big for Daddy to beat like that anymore. That's the last whipping I'm going to take. I touched a welt on his face and he winced. Two dark lines ran down his cheeks. They were tears. He beat me like that, Sterling grumbled from the foot of the bed, and I'm going to take that strop away from him and use it on his head. You and who else, I asked. You can't whip Daddy. But Sterling just might try it, and then Daddy would kill him for sure. I turned back to Junior. Why didn't you just promise Daddy to stop hanging out with the Ebony Earls? That's all he wanted. Because I ain't going to stop, that's why. He wiped his face with the back of his hand and lit a cigarette butt. The Ebony Earls had an initiate. The Ebony Earls had an initiate initiation meeting tonight, Sterling said. That's what that's where you've been so late, Junior, getting initiated? Yeah, Junior answered. That's where I've been. I'm a full fledged member of the War Council now. But why, Junior? I asked, feeling sick. Why? Man, nobody messes with the Ebony Earl, Junior said slowly, thinking it out. People see me walking down the street, they say, There goes James Adam Coffin Junior, he's a bad stud. Everybody respects a bad stud. Don't make no difference whether you're bad or not, just as long as people think you are. And you naturally get a rep just by belonging to the Ebony Earls. You automatically become somebody. Bullshit, said Sterling. You come with me to the next meeting, Sterling, Junior said. You ain't going to get nowhere with that shoeshine box, man. What kind of money is that? Next meeting, you come with me. Don't go with him, Sterling, I cried. Stay away from that stupid gang. You always said yourself they was stupid. Shut up, said Sterling, and mind your own business. Who invited you here anyway? Go on back to bed. I can't. I'm scared to go through the kitchen. I hear a rat. You wasn't scared to come in here with your nosy self. I started to whimper. With a curse, Sterling got up and walked me back to Mother's bedroom door. Sterling, you ain't going to join the gang, too. Please don't. He shoved me through the door roughly, but when he spoke, his voice was gentle. Don't worry none about me, Francie. I can take care of myself, you hear? He touched my face awkwardly, and then he was gone. As I made my way back to the couch, I thought that was the first time in a long time Sterling had spoken nice to me. Have a good day, friends.